Hey guys, stick around because today on the show, we have former Exodus guitarist, Rick Hunault. Rick joined Exodus after guitarist Kirk Hammett left for Metallica. And with Exodus, Exodus, he toured with Anthrax, Slayer, Pantera, and tons of others. And although Exodus isn't one of the big four thrash metal bands, many consider them to be in the top five. Uh, and we're gonna discuss a lot of Rick's time in Exodus, plus his new project, Die Humane, with the ex-drummer of Typo Negative. All this and more coming right up. All right, well, first thing, I got to make sure I say your name right, because I think people think it's Rick Hunolt, but it's Rick Hunolt, right? Exactly, yeah. How'd you know that? Yeah, I just heard you do in other interviews. <laughs> I think you had to correct some people. It's, everybody says Hunolt. And... uh it's got to the point where I don't even I don't even correct him anymore. <laughs> oh, really? Well, you know, I mean, whatever. Yeah. No, it's like uh, Don McLean. You know, the guy who wrote American Pie. I think a lot of people sit, think it's Don McLean, but it's Don McLean. But it looks like McLean, so it is confusing. No, it is. I sh I need to put one of those little one of those little U's over the U. You know what I mean? Yeah, like the Motley Crue kind of thing, and <laughs> right. Yeah. So. Uh, you got a new band together now. Uh, what is it called? Die Humane. Is that correct? Yep. Perfect. Yeah. Tell me about this. Cause it's got the drummer of, uh, uh, that was in typo negative and life of agony and is currently in a pale, a pale horse named death. Yeah. 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 That's his, uh, that's his main band besides die humane that he, uh, he, he doesn't play drums for that, that, that band. He actually plays guitar and sings and, and writes all the music. Mm -hmm. Um, quite a talented guy, man. Uh, so yeah, um, I, let's see about a year and a half ago, I was in, wasn't even trying to think about getting in a band really to tell you the truth. I just working, you know, I'm taking care of my kids. Um, and I get a call from a dear friend of mine, Steve Esquivel from uh skin lab. Uh, I've known him forever. He's one of my dearest friends. Um, and he's, we start talking. He goes, dude, I know these guys um, from Texas that are looking for a guitar player, but they don't want, they don't want a shred guitar player. They want more of a bluesy type guy. You know what I mean? A uh, less is more type guy. And I'm like, well, dude, I could do that. Um, why don't you send me some music? So he sends some over, and uh, honestly, I didn't even, I didn't even start listening to it till probably about like three weeks after that. And one day I'm just sitting there and I said, here, let me check this out. So I, I, I put it on and I was like, I started listening to it and I'm like, geez, this is crazy. Uh, because there was a lot going on. Like it was, it was heavy at times, but then times it wasn't heavy at all. It was like, sometimes it's not even metal at all. It's like, you know, there's not even distorted guitars anywhere in some of the songs. Um, and I was like, there's keys and horns and violins and these vocals, man, this kid can sing, bro. Um, and I started listening to it. And after a week or so, I just, I fell in love with the music, man. I really did. And uh, I was just, I was like, so I get a hold of Josh, the, the uh, one of the songwriters, the bass player uh, who does all the video stuff. He's, he's uh, actually a cinematographer. Um, and I started talking to him and we just we just got along really, really well, man. And to me, in a band situation, that's like one of the most important things because I've been doing it for so dang long. Um, that uh if 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 you can't get along with these guys, dude, it's it's just a waste of time, bro. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's never, ever, ever gonna work. Ever. Do you get do you get sent a lot of music like, hey, listen to this, listen to my demo, try to produce my demo, be in this band? Or is that I, I do, but um I more more so than produce, I get asked to do uh, a lot of lead guitar work mm. on stuff. You know what I mean? And at this point right now, I I just I'm too busy. I just can't do it. But I have done it. You know, I did a I did a solo last uh, last well maybe six months ago on the new Heathen album. Uh, obviously, did one on the new Exodus album. Um, uh, yeah, but some you know most of the the thing I really like is when um. I'm really accessible to the people out there. You know what I mean? And, and I make sure of that because I really love them. And I, mm -hmm. I really, really, without them, there is no music. You know what I mean? It's like they're, 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 they're the bottom line. So 
when these kids, these youngsters send me music and I just love to like give them direction, you know, in my, my honest opinion, you know what I mean? But that's why they're asking, you know? So I'm like, and I, I'm, I don't sugarcoat anything, you know, I'm honest and not brutally honest. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or, or discourage anybody, but I do want to be honest and like, let them know what's up, you know what I mean? Because it's a brutal business and, you know, um, I just, I like telling the youngsters which way to go. I like giving them direction. You know what I mean? That, 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 that makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. No, that's cool. So that you got an offer to join this band. Have you had offers to join other bands or to fill in or things like that? Has, has there been things you've had to turn down? Yeah. Um, honestly, like that's last summer. Uh, I actually had uh, a good friend of mine, Phil Demo, um, was going to go he, for violence, right? He's uh, ex-Machine Head. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he lives in, in, in Dublin, like three hours away. from. We're all from the Bay Area. You know what I mean? It's a pretty knit family. Um, so I got a call from them, and they, Phil was going to go do some Lamb of God uh, music. He was going to go tour with Lamb of God and fill in for one of those guys. And then they asked me to do the European tour of violence. And I was just like, man, at this point right now, I just really don't have the time, you know, because it, it takes a lot. It takes this thrash metal like that is just not easy to play. Um, So it takes about a month to prepare, you know, to really learn the music, like to be able to 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 do big shows like on a big festival stage. Um, And I'm just like, man, I just don't have the time. I, I couldn't give it the time it deserves, you know. So uh, I had to I had to pass that down, and I, I've got some other offers from people. Um, I really can't mention, but um, yeah, I mean sometimes I do, yeah, you know. But I'm I'm happy where I'm at now. But I, the music that we're playing is, it's just so different. You know, I played thrash for forty years, bro. Um, so, uh, and okay, so I'll tell you, but like right before the single was released, um, the the last two months. I'm like in my and my brain goes starts traveling, and uh, so I'm I'm getting pretty nervous about the release of of the first single, um, just because I'm I'm really I really care about what people think, you know what I mean? It means a lot to me. Um, that might be stupid or not, but it just does. Um, but uh, so a couple of months before the 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 new single release, I'm like, oh man, I'll be thrashed, guys. That, that, you know, are, are the fans going to like it? Are they going to think it's horrible? What's going to happen? You know, because it's got keys and all these different different elements and layers, you know, and it's just not thrash. This is not. Um, mm. And I'm like, well, that's the commitment I made. I love the music, so I'm just going to stand and stand by it. You know what I mean? And, dude, I mean, the, the response has been unbelievable. It's been, I mean, literally the day it came out, I sat there on the phone like almost all day reading the comments just because I was like freaking out. <laughs> um, and uh, I literally, honestly, I read two two bad comments. That's it, two. And I was just, I'm just really, really happy. Just, I just couldn't be any happier. That's awesome. Yeah, so the new single's called Oblivion. And, um, you know, it says like, showcases the eclectic doom-laden sound which, yeah. you know, it's, it's they say, uh, I don't know, I can't remember where I got this. It must have been like a, an article or something. And it says a wide ranging influence, in, including Typo, Celt Celtic Frost, Pink Floyd in a perfect circle. I'm like, that, yeah, that's I hear a lot of those kinds of it's a, a dark doom. But you're right. There's keys and there's there's breaks where it's not metal, but then it gets heavy. So yeah. there's and I think that's what makes it cooler, because if it's yeah. just heavy the whole time, that almost gets can get boring sometimes. But this takes, like, it kind of takes you back to take a break. <laughs> And then dies right back in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, really, honestly, this music is all about layers and, and emotions, and and uh, yeah, we're not, we're not trying to be heavy just for heavy's sake. You know what I mean? Uh, because we're all we're all all of our roots are in heavy metal. You know what I mean? But sure. there's, there's others. There's other parts. You know that we're all really, really diverse. We're all multi instrumentalists. Um, we can all pretty much play everything. Um, you know, so that helps a lot. Uh, it's just every the talent in this band is just it's insane, and we're all we're all we all have we all it's just we just want to be do something different, but that's all you know that's all. Um, I think and from the response that we've gotten so far, I think that the people are ready for different. Honestly, you know, um, 
heavy music is heavy music, but you can only, you know, you can only go so far with it really. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in a lot of aspects, uh, I will always be thrash. You know, my heart is, you know, and who's to say, well, I'm not going to start another thrash band tomorrow. Who knows? You know, if, if, you know, if it's, um, if the right people came together, hell yeah, let's go. Um, but right now I'm just really digging the direction that we're going and uh it's just we got four more singles to release until the album comes out May 5th. Uh and uh everything is going good right now. We're yeah, happy. so and this is not just like you're not releasing this independently. You're working with a uh, a label and a management uh, the, the management from the, uh, the the singer of Coal Chamber? Yes sir, Des Fafara and Anastasia um have been awesome. They they stepped up uh they stepped up because they love the music, you know what I mean? And they know that they're taking a chance with it too. Um, no one knows what, what it's going to do, but we all love the music. So that's basically where we stand right now. Um, you know, who knows? You know, we, we don't know. So um, just taking it day by day and see what happens. Just keep doing what we love to do. That's all. Des has been very helpful. He's behind us 100%. And Worm Group, um, I don't know if you're familiar. It's a really, really small independent label. Uh, owned by Ulrich Wilde, who does, uh, he's got a lot of history with um, Pantera and White Zombie and Rob Zombie and uh, Static X and uh, some pretty big names. You know what I mean? Huh. He's an amazing producer, boy. He, he is just phenomenal. He made this record sound so huge, bro. Did you have to send your tracks in or you didn't, you guys weren't able to get together and record it? Yeah, I, I actually flew to his studio in Hollywood and did all my lead tracks in a, excuse me in three days um uh and then uh but other than that that's the only time that we actually got together yep okay so then would you i mean you said that you had to turn down other tours so would you be able to tour for this band or oh yeah absolutely 100 percent. yep yep okay yeah. so your schedules change or this is just like this is enough that it's like you'll make it work no i'll make it work okay i'll make it work for this because my my uh, i have visions for this music live that's that's uh pretty pretty huge you know if we can it, i mean the music the potential is there put it that way that's i feel that um i think it, live in a live setting with a little bit of creativity and some production it could be like a show you know more like a like a more more than a concert but a show you know what i mean mm -hmm. um, there's so much done with the violins and the keyboards and the, and the sax it's just so many the dynamics are awesome you know, it could be really well done. How would you play that stuff live? I know that um, two of the guys are uh, multi-instrumentalists, uh, so they could they play those instruments, or would some of it have to be record pre-recorded? Or oh, no, no backing tracks. No, these are all real instruments, bro. Uh, the, everybody on the, on the album is all real. Right, but to do it live, could you, I mean you can't have a four orchestra live? No, but no, no it's just going to be sax and violin. That's it. Oh, okay. And then with Greg is our keyboardist. He's an actual full member, so. Okay, awesome. So the full, the the five full members um, are uh, actually four: are me, Sal, Garrett vocals, Josh bass, and Greg keyboards. So we we've got um, violins and sax on hold for rehearsals. You know what I mean? Okay. Where did you find uh, Garrett? I I know he was in uh, some band called Anova Skyway, which I I've not heard of them. I I just listened to him right now a little bit. Uh, to get a feel for it. but like yeah he's he's that was a real find because he's a, he's a great vocalist he, man he's he's young too but he's uh actually they found me you know they, they, him and josh had already been doing this project for like close to a year him and josh and greg and they were just looking for a guitar player and uh and the rest is history so garrett is actually um teaches teaches english in high school <laughs> yeah oh. So he's 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 really really an intense. He's got a, a degree in creative writing and all this stuff. He's really incredible, um, and he plays guitar too. And he's just an amazing singer, bro. Yeah. So would you try to do like a headlining club tour, or are you going to try to get on to one of these other tours, like and open up? And if so, which bands would you want to open up for? <sighs> Man, that's a, that's a crazy question. So that's that's exactly what's in the talks right now. Um, I'm not sure we're in a position to do a headlining tour as of yet. Uh, I think that we should get in, get in some clubs and, and uh, get our feet wet. You know what I'm saying? And see what happens. I think that um, 
So, okay. This is the crazy thing because our management basically has uh, metal bands. You know what I mean? Most of their most of their acts are pretty heavy bands. So Cradle of Filth, Ginger, Wednesday 13, um, all these bands. Uh, Exodus is actually is managed by Desno. Um, so my personal feelings is I really don't think that our band should be touring with a thrash band. You know what I mean? I just don't think it fits. Um, I, I could be wrong. I don't know. Um, but that's just the way I'm feeling right now. So if, if in a perfect world, bro, um, I'd like to go out with bands like Opeth, Mr. Bungle, uh, Nine Inch Nails would be like, forget about it. Um, you know what I mean? That's thinking big. We're thinking big here, bro. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to say like a Mike Patton, some of his projects, well, I feel like this is along the same lines is, as, uh, as that stuff. So Garrett, our singer, is heavily influenced by Mike Patton. Um, and who, who is it? You know what I mean? The guy's a genius. Um, he's, a, he's a literal genius. And he's in so many bands and he's got so many branches to the Mike Patton tree. You know what I mean? It's insane. Uh, and his influence are, are, shoot, this, are insane. Um, I'd love to go out with Bungle or anything he's got anything to do with, I would love to go out with. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of bands out there that are like heavy and not heavy, like Opeth and I know there's just a ton of bands out there we could go out with. We'll see. Primus would be a good one too. Um, you know what I mean? Something, something like that. Yeah, perfect I mean, circle. I, I feel like that's kind of got that same. Perfect circle would be. A, wow. I mean, yeah, we get a call from their guys. <laughs> you know where we're going. Appreciate yeah, it. yeah, and that's really cool. Have you ever come? Have you ever had uh, cross paths with uh, Mike Patton? Nope, I never have. His drummer, a whole bunch. Uh, he used to hang out with Jim Martin, the uh, no guitar player from Faith No More. He's he's yeah. from there. Mike Patton is from um, he's from Humboldt, like way up north for me. Okay, um, and uh, I've never I've never actually met Mike Patton. Nope. You said Jim Martin. I always I love that guy. Like everybody, he was such a fan favorite. I know he left Faith No More. What happened to him though? He he didn't start another band that I know of. Like he kind of disappeared. Yeah. He is a fan favorite, but you want to know something about Jim Martin? Is he's a fan? You know what I mean? <laughs> no, he is, and I am. I'm a. Fan. I consider myself to be a fan. You know what I mean? Me for, too. You know, a big time. You know, I'm. I'm. I'm as much of a fan as I am a musician. Period. That's it. I just love, love it all. And Jim Martin went on to do some stuff. I'm not really sure what he's doing now. Uh, I think I've seen some threads on the internet that he might be doing something new. Um, that the Faith No More actually might be doing a reunion thing if they can wow. get them check, you know what I mean, or whatever. That but, would be cool. I would definitely see that. Yeah, Jim Martin's a badass dude. Yeah. Well, you must have had so many stories like that, people that you've worked with over the years and and forty plus years of thrash metal. Yeah, man. Um, I mean, dude, it goes way back when. So we've almost almost played with everybody, but the the only people that we 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 played with Metallica a couple times in the Bay Area, but they <clears throat> we never uh, never played with them again. But we played with a lot of bands. Sabbath was probably one of the biggest bands. We, we did thirty shows with Dio, rest in peace, bro. Um, and it was Sabbath Black Sabbath with Dio. And that yeah, thirty two shows like with that. Exodus. Was that cool to meet Tony Iommi? Like it must have been. He must have been one of your heroes. Oh my God! Are you kidding? Yeah, and he wasn't. Um, yeah, it was. It was like, yeah, we were like, wow, dude. We're we're sitting, we're watching Black Sabbath every night, hanging out backstage. But Ronnie was the one that came out and and actually hung out with us a lot. You know, I mean, he was like something else. That guy was so nice. They were all really, really nice. But but Ronnie was the one that that really went out of his way to come hang out with us. That's that's really cool. Yeah, that that's definitely a bucket list item to be able to say you toured with them. Oh yeah, right. That's that's pretty killer, awesome. But yeah, we yeah. toured. We did the very first Headbangers Ball with Anthrax. That was incredible. Uh, that was like in the early early nineties. Um, that was the biggest. That was for us back then. We were just like, wow, we're gonna open the very first Headbangers Ball tour. That was insane. And for Thrash, that's pretty much like when, when Thrash kind of broke out, you know what I mean? Was was that tour. It was big. 
so fun. We had a great time with Anthrax. We love those guys. Did you guys do? You, I don't know if you even remember this, but supposedly you guys opened a show for Red Hot Chili Peppers in like 1990. Of course, I remember that. That was a huge show. That was home at, in the Bay. That was like literally a mile away from my house. It was at Henry J. Kaiser with uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Man, that was insane. Flea let me play his bass rig during sound check because I play some punk bass. And I was like, Flea, man, let me play. He was so cool. They were all really cool. And, you know, people to this day, you know, they see that on a flyer. And just, Dude, that's the craziest bill in it ever. And it was the craziest bill, but it was sold out. And the, it was it was incredible. Yeah. What venue was it? How many people was it? It was a big venue. Yeah, it was Henry J. Kaiser. I want to say like, well, they used the full because sometimes they cut the Henry J. Kaiser in half. So it was the full theater or whatever auditorium. Um, I'm going to say like 7,000. Dang. Okay. Yeah, it was was big. It was really big. That's cool. I got to admit, we, we crushed it that night too. It was killer. That's really cool. Did you see uh, recently, a couple of days ago, uh, they were talking to Charlie Benante and uh, they, he was, they were asking him, like, what was your favorite thrash record? And he said, Bonded by Blood. Yep, yep, yep. The number one thrash record, like, he yep. thinks it's the best. Well, Charlie's a great friend of ours, dude. We've known him for, honestly, we've known Anthrax maybe longer than we've known anybody except for Metallica. And uh, we grew up in Metallica, you know what I mean, in the Bay Area. When they came up, uh, so we we hung out we were all really good friends charlie um you know i could say the same thing about the first anthrax album you know it's funny because uh you compare the east coast and the west coast and we were all doing this almost crazy punk rock music but we all had long hair <laughs> and we we were metal you know but we were playing this really aggressive style music um and uh Charlie, for for Charlie to say that, that's 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 pretty incredible for him to say that. I mean, it was, it was kind of like a new music, right? Like when you joined, because I think you had seen the band play before you joined Exodus. Because uh, for people who don't know, Kirk from Metallica was the original guitarist, and then you replaced him. But you saw the band play, and it kind of blew you away because you had never heard music like that. Because this was like brand new music, pretty much. It was. It was brand new. There wasn't even a name for it. To, you know. Yeah, we were calling it back then. We, there, we were calling it speed metal, right? So, and on the East Coast, they were they were calling it. Um, it was the the mosh. You know what I mean? Everything mm. was the mosh pit. You know, and it was like we just called it the pit here in in the Bay Area. Um, but it's crazy how on both sides of the country we're all playing this really aggressive music, and then with the tape traders and how it how it grew. Yeah, so. To answer the question, yeah, so I the first time I saw Exodus, I was like, because I grew up with Van Halen, ACDC, Judas Priest, you know what I mean? I was into that. And I was like, I don't know how old, 17 years old. And uh, I got a call from our then manager, Adam, because he was a really dear friend of mine from Berkeley. And he goes, you know, they needed to borrow some gear, some cabinets. And I was like, sure. Um, so, you know, long story short, I show up and I'm watching this band. I'm going, holy crap! This is some crazy music, bro. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is damn near punk rock, right? So, and then uh, I got a call about a week later. I said, hey, you want to go jam with Gary? I'm like, what have I got to lose? Why not? You know what I mean? I was 17, no band. Uh, I spent most of my adolescence. I well, that was probably 18. So I spent. I bought a, my first guitar when I was 16. Sat in my room for a couple of years and never left, never went to parties, never did anything, just played guitar um, for a couple, three years. And then I joined Exodus and then that was it. That, that, that is so crazy. I was looking at the, the timeline because I know you started out on piano and then you traded the piano for the guitar because you moved or something and like the piano wouldn't fit. So you're like, oh, I'll get a guitar. So you only play guitar for three years and you're already joining one of the big, what would become later, uh, you know, not at the time, but it would become one of the biggest thrash bounds of all time. Did they look at other people or like, were you just that talented that even three years of experience? It wasn't that bro. It's like when I, okay. So when I joined Exodus, they were basically pretty much on the same level as musicianship as I was. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, we continued to learn and played so much all the time uh 
literally, you know, because um, we just all grew together. That was, man, honestly, that, now that you bring that up, I, my brain just told me this. Yeah, that's probably one of the reasons why Exodus back then was so, really, really special is because we were all growing on our individual music uh, instruments at the same time mm. together. You know what I mean? So that's, yeah, that's, 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 that's crazy to think about that. Yeah, and did you um wait? Did you play with a, in a band with Les Claypool or no? That's a uh, uh, Tom did. Uh no, that was um. Did, well, okay, so he made a he made a sat in with Blind Illusion um for a little while back then. Or you guys I, did I, shows together with Blind Illusion? Oh, Exodus, yeah. Did. yeah. Back in the day, day like like early eighties. You know what I mean? That's before I was even in Exodus. Blind Illusion was with Larry Lalonde from Possessed, now in Primus, uh, Les Claypool, um, obviously Primus, uh, and Mark Biederman, the guitar player for Blind Illusion, uh, was in was in Blind Illusion with with those guys. So um, yeah, I don't know, Blind Illusion, the the Blind Illusion with Mark has been together since early '80s. I mean, really, so almost probably longer than Exodus has been together. Mm, crazy yeah that, that first album so you said that i think you said 80 percent of it was already written by the time that you had joined but uh i mean they're still talking about like i said charlie benante just called it uh one of the best albums and then it got a I shout out and i love him for that that's so awesome yeah and then it got a shout did you see it got a shout out in cobra kai one of the characters mentioned it uh yeah, yeah I saw that. that was funny and rolling stone said it was the 45th on their album uh, uh their list of Hundred uh, greatest metal albums of all time. I mean, that's huge. Are you serious? Yeah, you didn't know about that one. Stone Magazine. Rolling Stone ranked "Bonded by Blood" as the forty-fifth on their list of the hundred greatest metal albums of all time. Crazy. Oh, I gotta get that issue, bro. I, I that's insane. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that, Chuck. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's just so cool that you're that you're a part of that. And then, so then you guys did the tour with uh with Venom and Slayer. That Dude, was tell me about that. Like that was sounds like it was kind of like a lot of hijinks. You guys are so young and well, let me tell you, dude. I gotta tell you. So okay. I joined the band. We start doing shows locally in the Bay Area. Um, and this is way before the internet. This is way before this is even maybe before CDs, bro. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so listen, yeah. um, so the the way that this music got around the planet was there's a very, very small group of guys. And Lars Ulrich from Metallica was one of these guys. And he was like up there. Lars had a huge, it was a huge, I mean, Ron Quintana, Sam Kress, Lars Ulrich, um, some other cats. These guys would tape, would, they would trade cassette tapes of these old demos. And they'd send them, to each other all over the world. You know what I mean? A couple guys in the UK, some people back East, you know what I mean? Florida, you know? And this, this is the way that, that our scene, our genre of music was born. Without these cats, who knows what would have happened? You know what I mean? You know, and th this is before Slayer even became, came up to the, to the, to the Bay Area. Um, so as we started doing gigs and then we got a call from these guys, um, because there was a buzz about the music from Bonded by Blood that was like rippling across the United States. You know what I mean? So we got a call from these guys, Todd and Ken from New York, who started a label called Torrid Records. And they said, yo, we want to we want to put your record out, you know, and we're, we're young. We're like, what, 18, 19 years old. We're like, hell yeah, hell yeah, let's do it, do it, do it. Long story short, so they got they got worldwide distribution from important records and and uh, which was cool. So we did a deal with them and um, went into the studio, recorded the album, started doing more more shows, and then we got a call. Uh, you guys want to you guys want to do this European tour with Venom? We're like, holy smokes! Are you kidding? We're gonna go to Europe and play play <laughs> with Venom. You know what I mean? And uh, so we're like little kids in a candy store, bro. We had our own bus. We flew to, we flew to, 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 um, to Europe. 
were playing these big venues with Venom and, and uh, Slayer. And we were just like little kids in a candy store. People running up to the bus. Let me have one of your picks. And we're just looking at each other like, what? <laughs> you want one of our picks? <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was like, it was like, it was living a dream, bro. It was like, I'm just so blessed, honestly, to tell you the truth. I mean, we didn't make no money. But we got to we got to experience the rock and roll dream, you know what I mean? And to to me, that is priceless for real. No, that's really cool. Yeah, you know it's interesting. And then so you go on to make the second album, the pleasure pleasures of flesh. Yeah. I didn't realize that was mixed by Sylvia Massey, who would go on to produce Tool and all these other great bands. Like, did you have any interactions with her? I just find it interesting because oh, sure. I think at the time that's like really progressive to have a female. <laughs> mix an album I, I don't think there was a lot of women in that field were there she co she sylvia um i think she she co-mixed and and co-engineered that that record but this is before anybody knew who sylvia was you sure know? yeah yeah and she she blew up bro you know five years later she's doing like big huge stuff you know what i'm saying and that was awesome and mark sinisak too uh and this is like, okay, so Pleasures of the Flesh was right when the di digital, I think it was right when the digital era was, 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 was happening. And so we decided to try to do the drums digital and analog so we could have, we ran into some problems. Let me just put it that way. Tom played too fast and the samples couldn't keep up with his kick drums. And we had to do a whole bunch of stuff over. and politics got involved and it was a big lag and was supposed to come out in a year and didn't come out for two years and that was the, that was our mo you know we were supposed to release albums and they would always be late and it was just kind of chaotic oh, but whatever right. it came out yeah and then you did that's when you did another tour with anthrax do you remember the you must remember this show the the dynamo festival Thirty thousand was that the biggest show you've ever done Thirty thousand people at that point, no, not not now. But at that point, it was like <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, that was the biggest show we had played today, for sure, no question. And that was Dynamo was run by a guy, a friend of ours, Andre, who um, is famous in in Holland. Uh, uh, and my, I know, I got to give a shout out to our Holland people out there. Th those guys had. I have so much love for Exodus and treated us so well. It, honestly, everybody has, but we have a lot of we have a lot of history with Dutch people. Um, and uh, so yeah, that was just the biggest thing, and we're just like kids. I mean, imagine that's pretty crazy, you know. And playing a festival on a big stage like that is a lot different than playing a club. You know, it's I find it I find it to be more difficult because yeah. it's outside and the stages are so huge. And if you don't get the proper mix, you can't hear nothing. And it's it's just, it's really crazy. You don't get no sound check. Uh, you know, you, it's just up there, set up, everything's set up for you. You know, you just get up there and play and that's it. So it's, it's it could be difficult at times. Yeah, no, for sure. So then I think it's Fabulous Disaster. Is that when you guys, that album was the one that kind of launched you with MTV, right? Because you had the Toxic Waltz on uh, MTV and then you did the, the MTV tour and all that stuff. Yeah, that, I mean, to this state, Exodus is probably known. That's probably the, the biggest, the, the anthem, you know what I mean? Uh, the Toxic Wall. So it's a great song. and People love it, you know. To this day, they're playing it uh, second encore every show, you know what I mean? So, you know, yeah, that song, that's the biggest song pretty much that, that people know. That's I think cool. It's probably the best, the best selling album to date. Which one? Fabulous Disaster. I couldn't yeah, yeah. a number but. Yeah, no. And then, and then your next one impact is imminent. Yeah. See, I was too young. Uh, I'm like discovering all this stuff later. Uh, Cause I didn't really get into metal till like 92, but there's a video on YouTube for imp the song impact is imminent. I can't, that, it's gotta be like a, a fake video though, or something, right? You guys didn't, did you make a video for that song? No, we never made a video for impact. Is imminent. Uh, where, where did you see that? Have you seen that one? It's like, it's like these people driving, there's a car crash. It's really graphic. It's kind of cool, but I feel like it's a, they took it out of a movie or something like that. Is it a video? Yeah. 
but I, you guys aren't in it. It's just like a plot and a story. It's it's kind of interesting though that they put that together with that song. Is it's it like cool. a lyric video or something? Maybe. What's that? Uh, is it like a lyric video? I've never seen it, but I've never seen it. Yeah, like I'll it. send it to you afterwards. It's, it's just kind of interesting. Yeah. It's kind of a cool video, but I was like, this clearly wasn't made in 1990. But yeah, so I just had to ask you about that. And that album is interesting too, because then you had John Tempesta on drums, right? Yep, who now plays for the cult. John's played with Testament, Rob Zombie, White Zombie, Clutch. Um, he's gone on to play with everybody and their mom. And you want to know why? Not yeah, only- that's exactly what I want to know. Why is this guy so good? Like, what makes him such a great drummer? He, I, I, I say, Johnny is like a dear friend of mine, bro. And I love the guy all my heart. He, the thing with Johnny Tempesta, bro, is he not only is the most fantastic, solid, high energy, incredible drummer, but he is just the best human being you could ever find. And that, that is why he gets so much work is because when you work with Johnny, you can't help but love the dude. He's just, he's like the friendliest. I don't think there's a bad bone in his body ever. You know what I mean? He's just, he's just a fabulous human being, bro. That's all there is to it. And that's why I, th- I I'm convinced that's why he's gotten so much work is just because not only is he an awesome drummer, he's just the best dude. You know what I'm saying? No, that, that's what I hear those stories when I interview musicians like like Rudy Sarzo is another one who he'll tell me like, because I was like, dude, you've been in so many bands like you're, you're with Ozzy with Quiet Riot. Right. And he says it's like, well, I got to, you know, part of it is can you play the instrument? Obviously, that's a huge piece of it. But the other thing is like, you got to be likable and you got to be professional. Like you got to be on time. They, they can't worry about you if you're, you know, if you're on drugs or, or if you're Absolutely. drinking too much, you fall off stage. Like, the, Absolutely. like you know, yeah. it, it, that's what I said in the beginning of the interview. It's like when when you guys, if you guys can't get along, you know what I mean? If you can't put your egos mm-hmm. in your pocket for half a second, then stop wasting your time, bro. It's not going to happen. I'm telling you, you know, and I tell this to these younger bands. I'm like, it's so important for you guys to be able to get along first and foremost. And then you can play, start playing some music. Just be friends. You know what I mean? It's it's so important. Without it, it's it's, it's just not going to happen, bro. Yeah, I mean, and there needs to be a respect because, like, hundred percent. That's the word right there. Bottom mm-hmm. line, right there. That's that's what that's what me and Gary had for thirty years. Is like, honestly, dude. Me and Gary, I was in Exodus for thirty years. Me and Gary never had one argument. Never. Wow. I don't remember when us? I mean, we had disagreements, but we would never argue. You know. And that we just there was so much respect going on there, and to this day is like my brother. You know, what I mean, all of them. You know? That's that's super cool. Yeah, we loved we loved hanging out. That's all there is to it. We loved playing music together. Period. I mean, we went through our we went we had issues. We went through our you know our our drugs things and alcohol and all that. Everybody did in the band, but we all we're all here to talk about it. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, yeah, thank, thankfully you were able to get cleaned up and stuff. So oh, yeah. you you were you don't want to rejoin Exodus. Like now that you're clean, I mean you could you could obviously do it if you wanted, but you don't have any interest in that or Well, you know, uh there's there's talks about doing some bonded by blood stuff later on. You know, they're 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 doing great. I'm doing my thing. Um you know, I I you know, if we if if we wanted to do if they wanted to do a tour and play some of the old tunes, I would be on board for sure. You know what I mean? Uh Joining Exodus again? Eh, I don't know. You know, Lee is a great guitar player and a really, really good friend of mine. You know what I mean? The, a lot of the fans want to see three guitars like like Iron Maiden. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay, dude, whatever. We're, we, you know, but uh, you know, they're they're happy. They're doing great. I'm doing great. So we'll just leave it like that and see what happens in the future. You know what I mean? Yeah. Would you? I mean, could you make? Or do you want to make? I mean, I'm assuming your goal would be to make die humane like a full-time thing but as right now it'd probably be more of like a part-time kind of thing uh well it's it's gonna grow into a full-time thing we'll just see what happens you know what i mean i mean that's how that's how it works um uh i'm let's see i think me and sal are the oldest guys in the band um so everybody's you know everybody really wants this to happen so if we get if if the right things happen and we get the right offers. Um, it's this will be a full time project for sure. Hmm, okay, that's what I want. I mean, my kids are growing up. Uh, you know, I I I left Exodus 
for one, to get my head together. And number two, to take care of my kids. You know, I was never home, bro. I wasn't making no money with the band at the time. Uh, you know, we were touring a lot, but I was coming home broke. It was, you know, things were tough back then, bro. And, and now they're even tougher. Um, so uh, we'll see what happens. You know what I mean? How did, yeah, I, I was curious like that part because, um, I mean, congrats. I think you have how many years of sobriety now? 13. 13, January. okay. Yep. How did you do that, though? Because that's got to be one of the hardest things to do, especially at that point after being in a band for so long and just – living that lifestyle to do basically an entire 180 and go totally sober. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, when they say rock bottom, that's no joke. I hit rock bottom. It, 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 it was either get my head together or go to prison, bro. That's it. Period. Um, or die. That's it. Period. Um, so I got in some trouble. Um, oh, I found myself in jail, called my dad. I said, dude, bail me out, please. I'm going to a program. So long story short, I got into a program, stayed there for six months and never looked back. That's, That's amazing. Cause usually it takes like multiple times. I know, but I had, I got kids, man. I get, you know, and, uh, I, I had to, I had to stop doing what I was doing. And you I wanted to make a change. It wasn't somebody say, Hey, you need to sober up. And you're saying, no, screw you. You're saying I want to get clean. No, I had to. Yeah. I want to more than anything in the whole world. I want to, I want to walk away from this, this life right here that I'm living or so living with it. You know, uh, I want to walk away from this life, turn around and just let everything and anything that's got to do with that life, meaning the people, places and things that's, you know, all of that, I gotta let it go. All of it. You know, that means friends that I had been friends with for many, many years. That if you, if you're not, if you're still using, I can't, I can't do it, bro. I can't do it. So I, I honestly, I left the Bay Area. I left the Bay Area. So um, I changed everything. Everything. Do you think is that the only way for people? to get clean. Cause I know like at one point you were homeless. Like, I mean, you literally were rock bottom and we have, that seems to be a big issue in the country right now. We have people who are homeless or people who are addicted to drugs and the drugs just take over. Like how do we solve as someone who's been in that position, how can we solve this problem? Is, is it just something where they have to decide it themselves? <clears throat> okay. So when you're, when you're that deep in that life, bro, um, you lose touch with who you are. Number one, it's not about me. It's about the high. It's about going out and it's, it's about that whole lifestyle. You get so you get so wrapped up in that evil life that you lose touch with everything, family, friends like, you know. So. My thought is that. Especially with the homeless and the mentally ill and the drugs. These people, they need purpose you know they need to find and with purpose you slowly once you have a little purpose in your life you can you can find some self-love you know what i mean some um some some self-love and that's where that's where it all the bottom line is you have to start loving yourself again and then you can then you can get some some strength you know and some some power and then you can walk with your head up and when you talk to people, you can talk to them, you look them in the eye, you know, and, but until then, that's what's the problem. I'm telling you, these, these people that are, they need some purpose. They need, first of all, of course, they, they want to, they have to want to get clean. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a slow process. It's a slow process. It's, I went to NA for years, you know, um, after, after I got out of rehab, just to, just to stay in touch, you know, and feel like I was doing something and give me some purpose. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, it helped. And it, it, I, I, I want, I wanted to change. So it's, it's a big problem out there with drugs, but and homeless people, man, it's, it's so sad. And when I go back to the Bay area, cause I live like up in the mountains, I go back there. Oh my God. I, I can't even go there anymore. It's just, it's so, it's gotten so bad. Where do you live, Chuck? I'm in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. So like, yeah, we have, we even have some people actually, some homeless people in Scottsdale, but it's, it's really bad. Like in parts of Phoenix, 
And oh. if I just drive, uh, I, I'm like right on the edge of Phoenix. So if I just drive a little bit uh, west, I, I'll start to see the the encampments and things and people on the street. It's just, it's really sad. Dude, well, it's even worse there because you're so close to the border. And that's right where the dope is coming straight to Phoenix. Boom. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then it's just, oh my God. You see yeah, the you fentanyl, mean? the blues, I guess they call it. I don't know if you ever got it. That might've been um, uh, after your, your, your thing, but they call it the blues. It's like smoking uh, blues of these, these fentanyl pills that they, they smoke. And like, I had a, a guy on my channel who uh, I had a guy on my show who does a YouTube channel and he just interviews all these uh, kids that are out there on the streets and they all, it's all the same story. It's called life in the streets or something like that. Yeah. yeah there's a few of them. Yeah. I watch it and it's, yeah. it's heartbreaking. It is. But I'm glad that guy's doing that because he needs to bring some awareness to this stuff, dude. Yeah. Uh, and most of those kids are like runaways from different states, you know, like barely 25 years old, bro. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just walking the streets. Right. Walking. Ah, Amazing. But see, that's what's so cool about your story is that to me, it's like so inspiring. You know, I mean, I'm not a, I never got addicted to drugs or anything, but I'm just saying for other people, like I, I would hope that that would inspire others like that you did it and now you're back and it's, I'm so glad that you're happy and healthy and you're making this new music. So, and I think the greatest is yet to come for you. I know Kirk was in Exodus and he joined Metallica. Gary was in Exodus and he joined Slayer. I think your big thing is coming. I think, I think you were in Exodus and now you're, maybe this is it or maybe it's something else, but I think you have something else big coming for you. I think. I appreciate that Chuck from, Hey, that means so much. We'll see. You know, I, I'm never good. I, one thing I learned in this business, bro, and with all the, the love that we get as musicians or whatever. And for one, I'm listen, guitar players, man, you know, I could do, I turn on Instagram and I watch these kids playing these guitars, dude. And they're so freaking good. And I'm like, I can't do that. I cannot do that. <laughs> you know, and I'm not even kidding. I cannot do that. <laughs> so it's like, it's like almost discouraging, but you know, I, I use it as a tool to like, you know, okay, I'm just going to concentrate on what I think I do good and just, and just, and go with that, you know, it, or else it, I'm just going to lose it. So um, we'll see. Uh, what were you, what were you, there was something I wanted to say to your, to, to the comment you made. Um, what were you just saying? The best is yet to come. I don't know. Uh, before that. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. And I appreciate that compliment. I mean, that, that's awesome. what do you, when you say um, you're going to focus on what you do best, like what do you think as a guitarist, what do you do uh, best? I mean, cause you must be able to play fast. You're playing an Exodus. That speed has got to be a, a part of your uh, strength. It's not at this point in the game. It's just not. So when you, if you listen to the solo in oblivion, um, some of it at the end is fast, but the more, the, the things that, that, that I'm, I like my, myself personally are, is the slower, more melodic feeling like Gilmore type stuff from Pink Floyd, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that's more of the, the route that I go now. Since, I mean, back in the day when I was 19, 20, 21, we played fast blistering. Um, the music was insanely fast, but nowadays I'm just, I, I gravitate to like more of the Neil Sean, Eddie Van Halen, uh, Michael Shanker, Gilmore type of stuff, you know, the more slower, more melodic, more feel stuff. Yeah. Do you like the? Are you a you're a fan of the blues? I'm assuming too, right? Yeah, for sure. That's I mean, my style is more blues than anything. Yeah, because like, so the song uh, "Good Day to Die" off Force yeah. of Habit. Now awesome. you co-wrote that song. Did you co-wrote the opening, the cool like bluesy opening of that song? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I played all the laughs, all the steel, all the slide guitar, and all that. Yeah, for sure. That's cool. Yeah. I'm so, I like when bands kind of mix it up. That's what I, I don't know. I don't know if other fans are not a fan of that album. That was actually the first Exodus album that I bought as a kid. And that, cause it was like 92, 93 when I was starting to get into metal. And I think I saw thorn on my side, thorn in my side on MTV. And I was like, Oh, that's a cool song. And I bought the whole album. Yeah. And uh, so I like that album. What is your thoughts on that one? Cause it, there is, a, it's a little bit of a different feel on, on that one. You didn't use the Exodus logo on the cover. And yeah. So the album, um, and I just want to get this straight. We did not change up for the for the for the um, for the label or nothing. That was just a natural progression of song yeah. that mm -hmm. me and everybody did. Um, we it wasn't like we wrote "Thorn in My Side" to be more commercial. Like let's let's write a commercial song. That's not how it went down at all. 
It was just so you know you you get you get influences from all the music that you listen to and that, that surrounds you, right? Like the, the grunge and that was grunge. Grunge was huge back then. Like I don't know. I think maybe sublim, sim, subliminally it might have it inspired me and Gary to write some of that stuff. Um, I don't know, but that's it was a natural progression. That, you know, I like I love that album. I think it's awesome. Um, a lot of people like the hard thrash heads don't like that album as much. You know what I mean? And it doesn't get the love like say uh, Fabulous or Impact will get. Yeah, I know. I like that one. That was that was my first introduction to Exodus, and then then I went back and listened to the other stuff. But yeah, I, I like that one, and I think that you're right. It was like the timing and the progression of the band. Uh, I think it still was Exodus. I think it was still heavy, but it, you know, it was a little bit a little bit of a uh, departure, maybe too much for some fans, but not for me. I, I loved it. Yeah, me too. I agree. And that was around the time that was when you did that tour with uh, Black Sabbath with Dio on vocals. Um, yep. I thought I read. Tell me if this was true, though. I don't know if you guys were on these shows, but was there a time when Dio was sick or something and Rob Halford came in and subbed some shows? Tour. Not on that tour, but I heard I heard the same thing. I think okay. that was in Europe. Oh, OK. So you weren't there. Um, Dio was man. Dio was phenomenal on that tour, bro. He he didn't miss a note. I swear. Watching that little guy sing those songs, and that's honestly my favorite era. Sabbath is the Dio era. Uh, really? Heaven and Hell. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I love Ozzy, but this it's all about the songs for me. And uh, Mob Rules and Heaven and Hell's that's my favorite. That's my favorite Sabbath for sure. Yeah. So you guys broke up for a few years, and then you you uh, you got back together, and you brought Paul back in, and then. Um, tell me what happened to this uh, this live album, um, because I heard there was a video shot of this, but the video was never released because of some sort of financial thing. Is there any chance that would be released now? I'm not. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, I'm sure there would be a chance of that. I, I should actually talk to Gary about that. Um, that album, as is a lot of people consider that album like one of the one of the best thrash live albums ever ever recorded. Uh, I only only because Paul is such a class. <laughs> Paul is such a maniac. I mean, if you listen to that album, if you listen to the things he says in between songs, the guy's a comedian, dude. He's, he's just, <laughs> literally he is just so funny and so passionate about what he's doing. And that's what makes it so funny, because he means that stuff. To you. <laughs> Some of the stuff he says is just over the top. bro. It's just so funny. Yeah, no, that is fun. Like you guys toured with Pantera too. Like they seem pretty funny in the videos that I've seen. I'm like, Oh man, this would be so fun to just like hang out with Pantera back in the day. Like they seemed oh, crazy. Yeah, it was, we, and, and honestly they were crazy. And then we, then we were crazy. And then, then <laughs> we got together and it was crazy for real. Um, uh, touring with Pantera. Okay. So I'll tell you a little story about touring about Pantera. Um, so it was uh, us and Suicidal and Pantera. But Pantera didn't join the tour until about two shows into the two shows into the tour. So we had already been we had already done a couple shows with, with Suicidal, and then they were going to join the tour. And then we were going to flip flop with Pantera, who who supports Suicidal, right? So, um, and at this time, none of us had ever even heard of Pantera. You know that given they had their their, sure. their jam albums out, but we had never heard of Pantera. Um, and uh, so Pantera shows up at the first, uh, and I want to say the show was in in Minneapolis at Studio One at Prince's Club, and um, Pantera shows up and they're setting up for sound check, and me and Gary were in the back of the club hanging out just talking, and uh, and Dime Dime plugs in his guitar and starts playing. And me and Gary looked at each other and said, holy crap, dude. this dude is insane. And we were like, oh, my God, listen to this dude play. And um, we became really, really dear friends with all of Pantera. And uh, it was amazing to watch, like, from that to, to how they blew up, you know what I mean? Because, uh, and I'm not, I don't know why, but Pantera just blew up. You know, they kind of left us in the dust, bro. But um, uh, they were it. It was a it was fun to watch, you know. And Pantera and Dime was just the most incredible guitar player, unbelievable. Yeah, 
That's amazing. It's yeah. cool. That I see. I think it's cool. They're, they're, they're doing the reunion that they have the family's blessings. And uh, I mean, they got Charlie on drums and Zach on guitar right. I and mean, you can get better replacements. And I think it would be cool just to hear those songs again. Cause I'm a fan and I, I want to hear those songs played live. That's exactly why they're doing it. Yeah. That's exactly why they're doing it. You know, there's money involved, but of course there is, but who cares? Sure. Honestly, if you talk to Zach or you talk to Charlie, they're doing it because they want to play the songs and they think that, have you seen the crowds in Chile and South America? No, is it crazy? Oh, get on YouTube and, and <laughs> dude, they're insane crowds. I mean, as far as your eye can see, the people are just jumping up and down. It's ridiculous. That's I love it. To it, it's ridiculous. That's so cool. And then I hopefully, you know, they can some bring up um, some new metal bands up and uh we can keep uh, metal going because i feel like it's weird like there's all these big old metal bands like you know the motley crew stadium tour is like huge, huge. and uh, but there's so many good young bands that i want you know people to discover too and of course your new band die humane is going to be hopefully really big as well and so hopefully you can get on some of these tours yeah and that and that's a, that's a good point you know what i mean um there's, like I said, dude, there's so many incredible guitar players and musicians that are coming up right now. Um, and they, they, they need, they need a platform. You know what I mean? I mean, sure. YouTube and is, is a good platform, but they need live. They need to play live. They need to be a band. They need to play live. They need to practice. They need to go and do shows. You know what I mean? And they need, they need a platform. They need to go. They need, first of all, they need clubs to play. Um, yeah. in the Bay area, that's kind of a, that's kind of a, they're, they're, we were really lucky Exodus and went back and then we had all these different clubs that we were playing. They're gone. They're gone. You know, all of the stones are gone. The Omni's gone. Wolfgang's is gone. Um, all these clubs are gone. You know, uh, we have the cornerstone in Berkeley. That's a new club that's, that people are playing at, but, um, it's hard. It's hard for the kids coming up now. Yeah, no, definitely. But there's just it, there, in some ways it's easier because anybody can put a song on Spotify and YouTube and, and whatnot. But at, at the same time, anybody can do that. So it's just this flooded market where you're trying to find out, you know, find the good stuff. And it's, it's sometimes hard to find but these good bands. If you, if you, but if you go to the live circuit, um, the bands that are actually out there doing shows, you know, a lot of these these Instagram guys and these YouTubers, they're not doing shows. You know, mm -hmm. they do. They play guitar on Instagram. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you don't see those guys doing shows with a band. You know what I mean? It's, it's a big difference, bro. Um, not to not to say anything bad about those guys. They're incredible guitar players. But you know, uh, and then not maybe they don't even want to be in a band. Maybe they want to. Yeah. Be, you know, that's their that's their that's their call. Um, no, that's true. Know. I I've I've interviewed some of of those people that, and now some of them uh have made the transition, and some of them are in the middle of making the transition. But you're right. There's a big difference, and they'll even admit that of playing in your bedroom and playing on a stage. It's totally a different ball game. Like I said from the beginning, yeah. being able to get a find some guys you could get along with, because of course you know, rockers. There's a lot of egos involved, brother. I'm not gonna lie. Um, you know, and it's it's all about going through and finding the right guys that you can, that you can, that you can just be in a room with. You know I mean? It's like being married to five guys. Literally. It is. It's just no joke. And like I said, if you can't get along, don't even waste your time. Bro. I know. I, I, people always say like, why can't this band or that band, why can't they just squash their differences and just get it together and, and tour? And, and I mean, I try to put myself in, in the shoes of some of these people and it's like, I, I mean, there's people that I can't stand for more than five minutes. I can't imagine having to tour with this person and being a bus with them. I mean, it, it would be really tough. You know, the human psyche is really, really an incredible thing. You know, okay, so like when you're in a band like this and you're at a level in a certain band and people like are constantly telling you how good you are. You know what I mean? Man, mm -hmm. I love you guys. you're so good, dude. Awesome. I, honestly, dude, it's like, there are certain individuals that start believing that, you know what I mean? And, and it gets to their head, bro. Honestly, I'm not going to lie. Um, it just happens. You know, um, they start believing the hype. You know what I'm saying? So 
you know, I get it, bro. Um, I, I was never that guy. Um, but there are people that are that guy, you know, and it's like, you know, it ends up being detrimental to them though, because oh, if everything you do is perfect and then you don't need anybody, like you don't need a co-writer to help you write the songs or someone to help you produce it. And you're writing a hundred percent, you're producing hundred percent. And maybe it's really not that good, but everybody's telling you it is then uh, I mean, eventually reality hopefully hits for these people and, and they make a change, but you're right though. If everyone's just telling you everything's great, you'll just keep making crap. I mean, Right. Yeah, but it, but, it, but it starts, you know, you start believing the hype, you know, it starts going to your head and your ego gets inflated and you walk around literally being not a very good person. You know what I'm saying? Um, and uh, in this, maybe back in the day it was different, but in this rock and roll world right now, in the rock and roll business right now, nobody wants to work with a a bad person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we won't say who they are because I, I got accused of being clickbaity. So I'm not going to ask you who it is. We don't need to say. I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but I get it. There's people out there that are like that. And uh, I'm sure, you know, we could figure, we could guess who they are. Like, I, I mean, I know just from doing these interviews, like, there's certain names that come up a lot. And so yes. that's just the way it goes. But I'm sure that's any business, not just. Uh, of course. Business. Of course. You know, when there's money and when there's ego involved, bro. You know, it's just some people, some people take it better than others. That's all there is to it. And some people are nice and some people aren't. You know what I mean? That's all. So how do it. you personally stay grounded? Do you think that's just your personality? Yeah. Or 100%, just my personality. I, I'm, I'm, I'm all about, I'm drama free as far as I, I just can't stand confrontation, bro. I don't like to argue with people. I don't, I want to be, why? It's a waste of time. I mean, that politics and all this other shit. I used to be heavily into conspiracy theory stuff. And so I, just, <laughs> I, I had to get away from that. Shit. It was just driving me crazy, bro. You know, um, politics, all that stuff, dude. That's just, I don't have time for it anymore. I'm 60 years old, bro. I'm like, you know, I'm almost going to be 60 years old. So I just don't have time for all that negative shit anymore. No I just don't. No, oh, that's cool. Well, you got the new band. Uh, I uh, hope that it, uh, everything goes out uh, really well for that. And uh, again, the single is out now, Oblivion. When does the uh, full album come out? It's available okay. oh, May 5th, I think it says, right? May 5th. May 5th. We, re we released um, uh, some more singles in a chain every every five weeks. And then uh, after that, the the because that's the new way, dude. You know what I mean? If yeah. Back in the day, we record an album there'd be a release date and the album's out. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not mm -hmm. like that anymore. With, yeah. with, with, with social media and the algorithms and all this other stuff, it's all about releasing singles and the timing. And then you release a certain amount of singles and then the album drops, you know? Okay. But, you know, it, it makes sense because it, it, it gives uh, it gives the al album cycle a little bit long longevity, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it gives you time to promote more and it makes sense you know what i mean in this day and age it does yeah and then people can pre-order the out the full album now, yeah, so now they pre-order they get like a vinyl cd or what a formats is it on all of it we have it all it's that's on worm group w w u r m group uh go to worm group and check it out you can okay i'll put the yeah i'll put that link in the show notes and then i always end up uh, to promoting a charity is there a charity that you've worked with or one that you want to promote if people have a, a few bucks extra after they buy your album of course 100 <laughs> thanks Jeff. um 100 so danny danny uh danny thomas what's the name of that hospital for kids um st jude's yes let's let's go st jude's okay yeah i've promoted them several times so that's a great charity it helps kids i think we can all get behind that it's like you said there's like a lot of politics and stuff going on i try to do something here at the end that just brings everybody together. Hey, we can all agree. St. Jude's good stuff. will help kids. So you're doing a lot of great work out there with your music and uh, entertaining people. I think that's important. Brings people together with the music. So hopefully you do some shows and uh, maybe I can catch one if you're coming through Phoenix. If we play anywhere in Arizona, I'm going to be calling you, buddy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. I, no, I would love to have you at a show. It'd be awesome. It'd be my honor. Seriously. Yeah, I want to see you live. That sounds amazing. Hey, by the thank way, you so much on your show, bro. I really yeah. appreciate it. You do some really good work on your podcast. 
You got a lot of big names coming through there, man. So what number are you at now? 230 something or no, this is like uh three something. I don't know, three fifteen or something like that. Yeah. Awesome. So it's it's you having fun? Yeah, yeah. It's uh sometimes I get accused of clickbait or I get a bad interview, but it's funny that the bad interviews, like I had uh Doyle from the Misfits and it was just a disaster. <laughs> And uh, people love that interview. They loved that it was a terrible interview and it just went shit. They think it's hilarious. So sometimes if I do a bad one, that gets more attention. Let me ask you a question. So what, what, what make, what constitutes a shit interview? Uh, when they don't, when they get mad at you or they don't like your questions or they don't, they don't answer your questions. Like listen to my Doyle interview. I mean, it's only like 15 minutes or something. He doesn't answer any of my questions. Like, He's just like angry. He's like that in every interview, I guess. I thought I was cocky and I thought I could win him over and I thought I was going to work really hard. I did all this prep. I, you know, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to get a good interview. And now it was terrible. So really? Yeah. Holy cow. That's insane. So <laughs> I was going to say that, man, you did, you did your homework. Yeah. You know, you know what's up, dude. So, and it's not easy doing that. You know, you have to really dig in and, and look around and read and, you know what I mean? So it's, yeah, it's a job, you know? Yeah, no, it definitely is. I just don't get paid, but it's a lot of work, but it's, but it's fun. I, I enjoy it. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, other people enjoy it. Then that's like the ultimate, it's, it's probably the same for music. Like you love making it. It's so fun. And then when other people enjoy it, that's like the ultimate high. Hey, anybody at my level. See, that's that's another thing is the, the fans think that we all are rich. You know, we're not rich. Right. No, I know. We're not rich. Exodus is not rich. We own homes. That's about it. Period. That's it. You know what I mean? But you get to make music. And for a while, that was like your full career. You got to make music and travel the world. And that's pretty cool. There's a lot of people that would love to be. Oh, are you kidding? Consider myself blessed. Like I said, guitar players are like, there's so many good guitar players that will never, ever be able to do that. And that just breaks my heart, bro. Um, so I'm out here trying to, trying to find these guys that want to go. I, I want to help them. You know, help them on their way and just give them the good advice, you know, because good advice is at, the, at at certain points in your career is something that I didn't have back then. You know what I mean? We didn't really have that, you know, because we just didn't. So we made mistakes. We, you know, we made, we made mistakes. That's all. What um, was the, what's the advice that you wish that you had when you were younger that you didn't? Get a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Don't sign any stupid, don't sign any stupid pieces of paper that you don't know exactly what that shit says, bro. Period. Um, be as humble as you possibly can be and be, be, be a nice human being. That's it. Period. I love it. That's perfect. All right. Well, thanks so much for doing this, Rick. Anything else you want to promote? No, Chuck. I just want to say thank you for having me on your show, bro. And I appreciate it. Just, I love all the people out there. I love you. Okay. Thanks, Rick. I'll talk to you later. Thank you, Chuck. Okay, bye-bye. Well, that was a really fun interview with Rick. My thanks again to him for taking the time to come on the show. Check out his new band, Die Humane, and make sure to follow his band and Rick on social media. And as always, your likes, comments, and shares help us both out on social media and YouTube for this interview or any videos done by his band. Uh, if you really want to go all out and help me out with the show, you can write a review of the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen I appreciate all your support. Have a great rest of your day and shoot for the moon. Yeah.